Um, I think Gillian is one of the most important people in the entire uh, 100,000 Gillian's project in that she's one of our earliest participants. She's chair of our participants panel uh, and she has a son with a rare disease who is in the programme. So Gillian, I've now lost you on my screen, but if you could um, uh, give us your presentation, please. Thanks very much. Thanks, okay. Um, thanks very much, Mark, and, and thank you everybody for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Um, it's really exciting to be able to tell other people around Europe how we've been getting on, and I'm looking forward to hearing the questions that you have about how we're, how we're doing it. Now, can I drive my slides? Yes, I can. Good. Okay, um, so I wanted to tell you a bit about participant involvement with Genomics England so far through the 100,000 Genomes Project, and then also go on to talk a little bit about how we're trying to embed patient voices into the NHS Genomic Medicine Service that Alex has been talking about. Um, as Mark mentioned, I am a participant in the 100,000 Genomes Project. My son, Sam, who's going to be seven tomorrow, uh, was uh, born with an unexpected genetic uh, problem, which has rendered him very severely disabled. And it took quite a few years before the 100,000 Genomes Project was able to get a diagnosis for him. Uh, he was the first person diagnosed in the NHS with a gene variant called GRIN1 which is something which affects how the messages move around in his brain. So as you can imagine, that's quite a fundamental issue. Um, but uh, myself and my son and my, my husband were in, recruited as a trio into the 100K project. And um, so uh, we've been in those clinics, we've sat in the, in the consenting conversations and, and that kind of lived experience is something that we've been able to bring along with many other people in the participant panel that I'll talk about to the, to the project as a whole. Uh, we're obviously aware that quite a lot of other people in the project are still on their diagnostic odysseys and that's something that we're keen to make sure they get answers for as well. Uh, I don't know how many of you were um, online yesterday to hear Mark Caulfield's presentation, but I'm sure it came through loud and clear in what he was saying that he really um, holds patients at the heart of all that he does. And I'm delighted that he's always been so supportive and encouraging in the particip encouraging participants in the project to have a voice in the decisions that Genomics England is making about what it's using our data for and who it's sharing that with. Through the participant panel, which I joined on the first day of its existence in April 2016 and have been chairing since 2017, research participants themselves can hold Genomics England to account. And we would encourage a similar model to be put in place wherever you have a large scale health data set. Let me tell you a bit about what we do. So the typical participant experience in genomics so far really is that you give some blood to someone you may not have met before, uh, it gets sent away for someone else to do some clever stuff and you may or may not get a positive outcome a number of years later. And, and with all the work that Alex and her colleagues are doing in the GMS, obviously that the time frame between giving a sample, having the test take, done and getting a result is going to be much, much shorter in the future, which is wonderful. But we still have the, the, the scenario where somebody's doing something in the middle with some stuff that really don't really know what's going on. And as far as we can tell, gaps in knowledge have to be filled by trust. You have to trust the organisation who's handling your data that they're going to be doing it in a way which doesn't put you to any disadvantage. One of the major ways that Genomics England have achieved this and continue to demonstrate their commitment to keeping participants at the heart of what they do is by hosting and supporting a participant panel. In the days when we could still meet and shake hands and drink tea together, this was the participant panel in action. Um, at the moment we're online, but we will get back together again eventually. Uh, our, our function is officially to oversee what happens to our data within Genomics England, and only people who are on the project or their close relatives are eligible to join in. Um, Vivian Parry, who's um, visible in the top photograph there, um, is our um, head of engagement, and she's always been clear that you have to have skin in the game in order to be a recognised voice on the participant panel. And I think that's absolutely essential because we bring that authenticity of lived experience to the conversations. Uh, we meet four times a year and we can call anybody who's involved in delivering the 100,000 Genomes Project to appear before us and we can ask them difficult questions about what they're doing and how they're getting on and tell them from our perspective, uh, our perspectives, I should say, we come from all walks of life, how we think they, or how we would like things to be done in ways which are going to make it the optimum patient experience. Because we're aware that for many people on this project who are seeking diagnoses for life 
altering uh, conditions, then it's a really serious thing. It's uh, something which is, is fundamentally affecting who they are and what they can do in life. And it's, it's so important to get it right. Uh, the chair of the participant panel reports directly to the Genomics England board and to the chair who um, we have Baroness Blackwood is chair of Genomics England now, and she is herself a rare disease patient. So she really gets where we're coming from. And it's wonderful to feel that support from her. Members also sit on other working groups within Genomics England. The next slide I'm going to show you tells you a bit more about that. And over time, as the data that Genomics England is collecting about patients in Britain expands to include people who have COVID and people who are coming into the research side from the Genomic Medicine Service, we're hoping to include in our membership people who have come in from those paths so we can make sure that we're representing them as well. The role of the panel has grown over time. I think we demonstrated at the beginning that we have uh, quite big noses and we like sticking our beaks in quite a lot of the different bits that Genomics England do. But fundamentally, this was our original purpose, which was to oversee the use of this patient data. If we imagine, if, if you think of this as a data bank, um, there are uh, different layers of protection around that data um, involved. And uh, the Access Review Committee, the Ethics Advisory Committee, the Discovery Forum and the GSIT Board are four of the um, committees within Genomics England who have active roles in, in overseeing what happens to the information that they've collected. So the Access Review Committee, as you may imagine, is the committee which is independently chaired, um, decides who gets access to the information which is in the data bank and uh, oversees the project plans that they put forward at the beginning when they originally asked to come in. And at the moment, the Access Review Committee has about 50% of its membership drawn from the participant community, and the other 50% are independent clinical and medical experts. Um, so that really gives us a very strong voice at the heart of those decisions about who's allowed to come in and look at our data. The Ethics Advisory Committee can comment on anything, any aspect of what Genomics England is doing. And again, we send three participant panel members to sit on that committee, and they have been growing in the strength of their voices over time. And I know that um, at the moment we're, we're um, working hard on trying to make sure that the return of the additional findings that Alex Pickard mentioned there is going to happen in, in a way which will be um, um, really helpful for patients and not cause them any additional alarm. In many cases, people joined the project many years ago and may indeed have forgotten that they asked for additional findings. So we have to make sure that the, the, the recontact there is, is done in, in proportionate and uh, effective ways. The Discovery Forum is the grouping which uh, Genomics England have in the past brought together in, in partners from industry in a pre-competitive space to share their ideas. And we have been sending two participant panel members along to talk to them and to hear what they're up to as well. And then the GSIT board, and that's the Genomics England Clinical Interpretation Partnerships. Um, I think that's right, Mark. Um, they, um, they oversee and try and, and draw comparisons and connections between the different researchers. Obviously, in, in the kind of information that's collected at the moment, there's a potential for them to be looking at things in silos. And I think the GSIT board um, are, are trying to make sure that learning from one part of the forest is shared with others. And we send three participant panel members to the GSIT board as well. And it's wonderful to hear back from them about what's really going on with our data, because I think there's a tendency for the researchers to be doing their research. And it takes many years in many cases for the findings of that research to ever see the light of day. We've also been trying to help improve patient experience in terms of how their whole genomes are collected and the information that they're asked to provide at the time. And as I mentioned, working to maximise patient benefit in terms of returning results of individual tests um, and wider research findings over time. I'm pleased to say that has, having established ourselves as a credible voice of patients, we've been invited to contribute to national genomics policy. And I actually now have a seat on the National Genomics Board, which reports to Lord Bethel and is here to oversee what happens about the implementation of the Genome UK strategy that Alex mentioned. And we're contributing to the ongoing public discourse on genomics. Uh, there's a study happening at the moment talking about um, people's perception of the potential of using whole genome sequencing to um, find out uh, more about newborn children, potentially as a replacement to the blood spot tests, which have been undertaken up till now. And we've been helping to contribute our own patient stories to that, but also to help um, broaden the debate 
um, and help as many people out there hear from us about what genomics can do and the sorts of protections that we would like to see around that in order for it to work for everybody. Um, this is a very complicated slide, strongly recommend screenshotting it and looking at it later. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, recently we, oh, sorry, that doesn't help. Uh, we, um, in 2020, we updated our terms of reference and uh, the headline news there really is that we continue with the full support of the board at Genomics England to hold them to account about what they're doing with all of our data and um, to keep pushing for results for people within the 100,000 Genomes Project and to make sure that we also expand to take on board the voices of people with COVID and people coming through the Genomic Medicine Service as we move forward. And one thing that I'm particularly keen to emphasize in the year ahead is to be the, the final point on the slide there to encourage and facilitate genomics based research into rare diseases and cancer that embodies the principles of co production where project participants and patients and their families can share the benefit of their lived experience if they wish. We don't want to turn this into a scenario where people feel they're being milked for information and are constantly badgered by um, researchers who want to ask them a whole lot of different questions about a whole lot of different things. But we would really like to make it easier for people who are interested in talking to the researchers about the conditions that affect them to be able to do that. And so that's what the one thing I'm really trying to concentrate on in the year ahead. Coming back to uh, something, I think you've seen this picture before, Mark used it yesterday, but it is a lovely collection of uh, people on the project. That's uh, me and my son in the middle there. Um, that was a few years ago now, but um, he's still as cute as that. Um, we, um, we, we would like to remind everybody that when you're looking at large scale data, there can be a tendency to sort of forget that every data point actually has a face. And this is something which is fundamentally important when you're thinking about how you demonstrate trustworthiness to the wider world. You have to make sure that the sorts of things you're doing are, are things that they would want you to do. There's a legitimate expectation that people have that their data will be used. They've obviously volunteered to give this data to the study. They want to see it used for maximum benefit, but they want that to be done in safe and responsible ways. And from that perspective, I think I, I would also just like to add um, that it's an exciting time for Genomics England, expanding and looking to the future. And we will keep working with the, the management there. It's a key part of ensuring that Genomics England retains the trust of the people whose data it holds, which is fundamental to the ongoing success of the enterprise. We all want our data to be used to develop new diagnostic tools, new treatments, or even cures for our health conditions, but we need to trust that it's happening in safe and responsible ways. We think our model of continual involvement where actual research participants are able to scrutinize and influence what their data is used for, as opposed to engagement, which may be something where you are telling the public what you're doing rather than in inviting them to comment on it, is one that must be replicated. If these trusted research environments, the, the name we're using in Britain to refer to these kinds of data sets, um, if patients are in the public are to consider them worthy of that trust, we have to make sure that we keep talking about what's happening inside them. So that's the Genomics England side of things. I'd just like to talk a little bit about the NHS um, and the Genomic Medicine Service. Um, I was really pleased that the Genomic Medicine uh, or the, um, the Genomics Unit um, came to talk to us about what we've been doing in terms of patient involvement and engagement when they were designing how they want to go about doing it in the GMS. And uh, we've been involved from the beginning there in trying to shape how they do patient engagement and involvement in ways which will bring in the patient voices that they need to be hearing. So this diagram uh, shows us a, a bit about how the, how the uh, patient engagement and involvement activities are going to work once the NHS has finished setting up uh, and commissioning all the different alliances and healthcare um, uh, partners. And um, uh, the green on this form, sorry, I've just been distracted by a question in the chat there. Um, the, um, the, the green boxes here show what Genomics England is bringing to the party. The Genomics uh, participant panel there is going to be sending um, one or potentially two members to the National Genomics People and Communities Forum, which is the name that's been chosen to be the equivalent of the participant panel within the Genomic Medicine Service. Um, the other people who are going to sit on that forum will be drawn from the GMS alliances, so from these seven regions around England, they're each being tasked with setting up a, a public and patient voice group 
in each of those places and the chairs of those seven groups will be coming to the forum once they've been appointed. There's also a, a set of national public and patient voice roles and um, the GMS has been, uh, been careful to make sure that there are actual patients advising them about the test directory that Alex mentioned and a number of other things that they're thinking around um, commissioning at the central uh, the strategic level and so those patient voices are also going to sit on the communities people in communities forum um, once they're all in post and there are a number of other people there also representing the wider patient communities so the genetic alliance and the uh, charity called unique who represent people with very unusual uh, chromosomal disorders are, are also very important voices at this stage in advising the forum um, about how we would like to see the service being delivered. And I think the most important thing is that the reporting line upwards from the forum goes straight to the programme board at national level and the partnership board which oversees the, the, the join between Genomics England and the NHS side. It's really it's so important if you're going to have a body which is there to speak up on behalf of patients, you have to give them somebody really significant to be talking to, otherwise you will, you will begin to um, run the risk that that group becomes a talking shop rather than a, a forum for action. And we think it's really important to make sure that the reporting lines are very clear and very senior up to somebody who could um, actually make the changes that you're asking for.